first thing I'd like to do is build a feeling for the essence of birds by considering the ways in which bird species are similar and ways in which they differ from one another. But let's look at some statistics first regarding the class Aves. As of today, there are about 10,000 species of birds. These can be broken down into 30 orders and about 185 families. Now the group is well defined taxonomically at the species level. Only about one species per year maybe is discovered and even this is a surprising event. Above the species level, however, taxonomy has historically been much less stable because of the difficulties of assigning such similar looking creatures to different groups. There used to be a good deal of disagreement about who was related to whom. But with recent advances in genomics, we've now begun to piece together a lot of the higher level relationships. Nevertheless, recent changes are always a pain because of the name changes and then organizational changes that have to be made in field guides and on and on and on. We'll provide some stories about recent changes in family and order groupings of bird species in the lab. Now, birds come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And there are species as large as the flightless ostrich, which stands about 8 to 9 feet tall and weighs about 350 pounds, to the tiny, tiny, small 2-gram bumblebee hummingbird of Cuba. Despite these differences in size, birds are generally more similar to one another in overall shape or body plan than is the case for, say, mammals. And this is thought to be the result of constraints on flying machines. You know, you can put any bird out on a table and a five-year-old will say, bird, doesn't matter what size, they, they share some sort of gestalt that's really interesting, whereas mammals are as different as a shrew and a, a whale and a bat. And, uh, and unlike a variety of birds, you don't think of these mammals as belonging to the same group. Let's deal with our first mystery in ornithology. What sets the lower and upper size limits in birds? Let's start with the lower size limit. What's the problem that becomes too overwhelming as birds get smaller in size? You guessed it, they lose body heat too readily. If you don't understand this, just think about it. Why should that be? The reason is thought to be related to the fact that the surface to volume ratio of any object increases as the same shaped object gets smaller. So for example, a robin has a greater surface to volume ratio than a crow. Well now you should be asking, well so what? That doesn't make the robin the smallest bird. So all we have so far is the fact that the surface to volume ratio changes with size. What's the empirical evidence that this only becomes a problem when we reach the size of something like a hummingbird? The evidence that we've hit an endpoint comes from the fact that the smallest birds, one, need to eat high energy foods more or less constantly. I mean, little hummingbirds are sucking on sugar all day. And two, they go into torpor on a daily basis. That is, they shut down their engine, which produces heat, uh, on a daily basis. And then when they wake up in the morning, turn the engine back on. These two facts are consistent with the hypothesis that the lower limit to size in birds probably has something to do with heat loss due to the high surface to volume ratio that smaller objects have to endure. Okay. Let's go to the next problem. What is it that happens? What becomes too overwhelming as birds get larger in size? Now, there's probably something that prevents large critters from flying, but what would that be? Why does it become more and more difficult to fly as one becomes larger and larger? Let's start with the theoretical argument first, argument. And then let's look for empirical evidence that this is really the size limit problem that larger birds encounter. 
Take a look at planes. Why are there no birds as large as 747s? Hey, they'd fly just fine. Well, it may be a function of the power needed to fly. Larger objects need more power to fly. So you might say, OK, so add more power. But the problem is the power needed goes up exponentially with the size of the object, in this case birds, with body mass. So power needed to fly increases exponentially, not linearly, with body size. So the power needed does not increase in linear fashion with weight, but increases at an ever-increasing rate. So an ever-increasing amount of body mass has to go toward the muscle needed to power the birds, which sooner or late, later you know, reaches the limit of about a third of the body's uh, mass. Let's take a look at the empirical evidence. And here is a cool plot where you actually can look at the proportion uh, of body mass that the flight muscle makes up in three different uh, accipiter species, hawk species. The smallest sharp shin hawk, only about 10 or 12% of its body mass is the flight muscles. Cooper's hawk gets up to 15, 16, 17%. Goss hawk is all the way up toward 30%. So it's increasing at an ever-increasing rate. If you were going to be twice the size of a goshawk, what would you have, 60% flight muscle? You have nothing left for anything else in the bird. So this exponential increase is one bit of empirical evidence. A second thing, large birds have more difficulty than small birds do in becoming airborne. Just take a look at something like this mute swan trying to take off. It doesn't just jump into the air and fly away. It has it needs a platform to run along for a football field before it gets airborne. Three, the largest flying birds most often soar. That is, they're not using their own muscle mass. They're not beating their wings, getting the power to fly that way. They're getting energy to fly from air movement. And Fourth, the largest of all birds, and same with mammals, they don't fly at all. Okay, so the only thing keeping birds smaller, it seems, is probably related to flight and constraints of flight. Next, I'd like to talk about features that most birds share. And textbooks like to emphasize certain anatomical features that birds share. So let's start with bones. Uh, most of these details will be seen and better appreciated in the lab. Now, long bones are thin and hollow or pneumatic, which makes them really light. But they also contain strut-like structures to maintain their strength. Second thing, the skull. Take a look at the skull. It's highly fenestrated. There's no teeth and therefore no large muscle masses for chewing. Now, there's a lot of fusion into single solid sections, which increases the strength and decreases the weight over much of the body. So let's take a look at the syncecrum, for example. This is where the thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and caudal vertebrae are fused to form a single unit called the syncecrum. This in turn is fused with the ischium, ilium, and pubis, resulting in increased strength for takeoffs and landings without adding extra mass. The last few caudal vertebrae are fused into what is called the pygostyle, which is the site of feather attachment. Now the hand and leg bones in the pectoral girdle are also greatly fused, as you'll see in lab. I mean, take a look down here. The fibula is fused with the tibia, and the tibia with some tarsal elements. And so you can't even tell what's going on anymore, so you just call it the tibiotarsus. And down here, tarsal elements are fused with metatarsal elements, so you just call it the tarsometatarsus. Now, Reduction in number of digits is another thing that's interesting. Not only are the digits that are present fused, but some are missing altogether. Notice there's only one digit one, digit two, can't even find three or four. And here, four digits uh, in the toes. Ribs are long, flat, 
and thin and they're jointed. If you look at it at a rib from the front of the bird, they're so thin it's like a razor blade, but they retain their strength through these little processes called uncinate processes that reach back to the rib right behind. There are hinge joints from the elbow outward, which reduces weight that would otherwise be needed for supination muscles, muscles to twist the arm uh, back and forth. Now perhaps the most important feature is one that all birds share, and that is feathers. These structures are lighter and stronger than most anything we humans have been able to manufacture for similar purposes. Now in addition to bone features, uh, there are features uh, that are sort of weight reducing and could be argued uh, with the urogenital system. There's no urethra or urinary bladder, so there's no storage of heavy material. There's only one ovary or oviduct, which is functional, the left, as you'll see uh, in the lab. And the ovaries and testes recrudesce or grow during the breeding season and then atrophy afterward. During the non-breeding season, you, you get a bird, you skin a bird, open it up, you can't even tell if it's a male or female. The ovaries and testes are so small. Eggs are laid soon after they're formed. It takes about a day total, so, so females are not flying around with extra mass for extended periods of time. So all these things are features that are thought to be related to uh, the evolution of flight. Finally, there are weight positioning adaptations. All the vital organs are near the center of gravity, right in here. The entire mass is located centrally between the sternum and the vertebral column giving the bird great aerial mobility. It can twist and turn really rapidly. Notice the function of the teeth has been given to the gizzard, which is also close to the center of mass, thus there's no need for long counterbalancing tail. And then the pelvic and pectoral muscles are shifted to the center of mass so that no muscles are at the extremities, controlling the fingers and toes, for example. Even the muscle that raises the wing is under the wing, as you'll see in lab. Now, even though there are gross similarities in body form due to the constraint of having to fly, there are countless and sometimes bizarre differences among species that have developed within the constraints associated with flight. Now, what kind of differences are we talking about here? The more dramatic differences among species have to do with leg length, toes, claws, webbing, that sort of thing. And with things like bill sizes, bill shape, tails, coloration, there's lots of variation in those respects uh, among bird species. Let's skip the beaks and feet for a minute and look at the size and shape of birds as a whole. Bird shapes can be represented by two variables, wing loading and aspect ratio. The aspect ratio is, is merely the uh, ratio of the length to the width of the wing. So the longer the wing, narrower it is, the higher the aspect ratio. Wing loading, on the other hand, is a ratio of body mass divided by wing surface area. So the bigger the body, the heavier the body mass, and the tinier the wing, the heavier the wing loading. And we can see there's huge variation among birds in these two uh, characteristics that represent the shape of the bird. What has promoted the evolution of these differences? And more generally speaking, why are there so many different kinds of bird species? Now we have several categories of ways that bird species differ from one another. I showed you those. And it's usually argued these differences are associated with or caused by differences in diet. So if you're going to give a lecture to third grade or fifth grade class, and talk about birds, I guarantee you most people are just going to look at bills and feet and say, see, they're different, and that's because they eat different things. But let's, let's look at food a little more closely, and I think what you'll discover is that uh, diet alone leaves us short of explaining the existence of 10,000 different species. So here is a table that was created by Doug Morse some 30, 35 years ago. 
And what's really cool is if you look at the table, he divided uh, birds into families at that time considered to be 168 different families and simply listed whether birds used a particular food commonly or rarely, if at all. So green plants, for example, and buds were used commonly by 28 families of birds, rarely at all by 140. So, uh, you know, less than 20% of all birds and twice as many than that, as, as, yeah, use seeds as use plants. And half again, as many use fruit. And then you can have relatively rare nectar use. But then get down to insects and holy cow, is that amazing. 140 out of 168 families use insects commonly. That's what birds are all about, apparently. Then there's uh, other categories of food, littoral or benthic invertebrates, fish, vertebrate species, and carrion. So let's take a look at each of these kinds of diets. Here's the green plant diet. Uh, the Watson on top is exclusively vegetarian, eats largely mangrove leaves, for example. Its digestive system is highly modified to facilitate use of vegetation. Um, Many of these birds have large crops, which do some of the grinding, and they have large cecum uh, where they store bacteria that can help digest vegetative material. Ducks, geese, and swans are also primarily folivorous. They eat aquatic plants. Uh, grouse, of course, eat only needles and buds. Sage grouse eats almost exclusively sage leaves during the winter. And this way, of course, this way of life is not that common to birds because of the large retention time necessary for digestion of plant material. You know, if you're going to carry around a lot of plant material in your gut, you wouldn't be able to fly. And indeed, most of the species uh, that eat vegetation are on the edge of flight limits in terms of body mass to wing. Uh, they're wing loading. They're heavily wing loaded. Seeds. Let's take a look at seeds. Twice as many families feed on seeds as on green vegetation, and most of these are finches. They have large, deep, strong bills for cracking seeds. Some have sublingual pouches for carrying seeds, like the nutcracker, which can store up to 150 seeds in its sublingual pouch. Take a look at that picture of the ponderosa pine seeds in that nutcracker's pouch. You know, acorn woodpeckers store seeds in holes drilled to size. Crossbills, open cones with their special bills. You can see some of these videos uh, in lab. Fruit, 44% hmm, of bird families are involved with fruit. More families eat fruit than seeds, and most all fruit specialists are tropical birds. In seasonal environments, like up here in Montana, fruits tend to be taken by more generalized species that also eat insects, not by specialists that eat only fruit. Most have short bills and specialized digestive systems, simplified systems where they can run that fruit through in a matter of 10 minutes and get the pulp out, uh, digest the pulp, seeds pass through, plants benefit, birds benefit. So birds are dispersing seeds by eating the seeds directly or by eating fruit. Nectar, few families here. 10%, but striking modification to deal with this food resource. Most of the species are hummers and sunbirds. They have long bills, tubular tongues, and uh, pollen eaters. There's some pollen eaters too that have mop-like tongues. Many of these nectar-feeding birds have co-evolved with plants to become entirely dependent, where they become entirely dependent upon one another. So the bird will evolve an elongated bill to better deal with a particular flower. Then the flower changes its shape in response to the way the bird changed and back and forth and back and forth. It's called co-evolution. Now, insects. Note, this is where birds are at. About 50 families feed exclusively on insects. So um, adaptations reflect the way food is captured for most part. Some species are adept at capturing insects in the air and are unchallenged by any other diurnal group of organisms in this way of life. Flycatchers, for example, um, 
they can detect and funnel and find these insects flying in the air. Swallows and swifts take advantage of insect swarms. Warblers peck insects from vegetation with their fine pointed bills. They hang and glean and hover and probe. Woodpeckers chisel bark from trees and beetles. They get beetles beneath the bark. Um, Sapsuckers build traps. Thrashers probe in the dirt and on and on and on. So I think the point here is that insects uh, there's so many species are involved in getting insects because there's so many different ways to get an insect. Then literal invertebrates, shoreline invertebrates. Shorebirds do this and have a variety of leg sizes and neck sizes and bill sizes that allow them, them to probe at different depths, stand in different depths of water. They all have super tactile bills to be able to feel stuff under the sand or mud. Fish. Birds that use fish have ridges of hook-like structures or their serrated bills like a merganser. Pelicans have pouches and to aid in the capture of fish. The osprey has scales with spikes on the bottom of their feet to hold slippery fish. Herons and egrets plunge their bill into water and spear fish. Herons may even shade an area with their wings to attract fish and then spear them. In Japan, there's a green-backed heron that uses bait to capture fish. Maybe you can see this video in lab as well. Kingfishers, of course, spear fish with their lower bill and skimmers skim the surface of the water to get goodies and their lower bill even grows faster than the upper bill to compensate for wear. Then we have birds that eat vertebrates, other birds, or mammals, or, you know, snakes and lizards and frogs and toads. Now these birds have large, or not necessarily large, but long sharp talons to grasp and hold their prey and hooked beaks for tearing prey into bite-sized pieces. So that's what characterizes a raptor. Uh, they have long sharp talons and sharply decurved beaks. Then carrion is the last group uh, that uh, Doug Morse identified. Not very common. The birds that do this tend to have bare, featherless heads, probably for reasons related to sanitation. Most of them are super soaring birds with broad, slotted wings. So, birds eat lots of food types, and the bills and legs and foot types correspond roughly with the food type. However, a few dozen basic food types is still a bit short of explaining the existence of 10,000 kinds of birds, don't you think? So even more importantly, let's look at the variety of species within a single diet category. You know, you can, you can look at one kind of food type like fish and you see still see a huge variety of birds. So what's going on? It's not diet per se when you're trying to explain why there's so many different kinds of birds. Let's go back to the sizes and shapes of birds again. Look at the aspect ratio and the wing loading of a variety of birds and if you plot a bunch of different kinds of birds on the same graph, what's interesting is that the variation is not easily attributed to diet. The variation is better correlated with the style of movement, that is whether they fly fast or slow, up or down, and the style of their flight, not, not diet per se. So here's a graph from Jeremy Rayner where he plots the wing aspect ratio against wing loading and this provides some ecological insight into morphological variation uh, that's related to flight. The distribution of bird shapes in these two dimensions puts similarly shaped birds together, right? The important thing to note is sometimes you can find different food types even when the, when the wing size and shape is the same. But what's really cool is you see, can see the same food types that are eaten by very different shaped birds birds that are shaped very different. This variation in shape is related to differences in the way the birds fly, the way they get their food. So you can see some species that eat fish. For example, near the bottom you can find uh, storks and vultures. Uh, and then you go off to the right and you can see, oh gee, there's cormorants and petrels and puffin. Then up sea ducks and divers, murres then over to algannets and albatrosses and skimmers. 
and then over to the frigate birds and down to the kites and down to herons. All those things eat fish, but notice that very different shaped birds take the same dietary type. Therefore, the variation among birds has to do with the way they're getting food, not so much the kind of food they're getting. Okay, I'm going to give you two more examples of the ways body shape can be related to the way birds get their food. So let's look at some raptors, uh, a budio, an accipiter, and a falcon. All these things eat vertebrates, either mammals or birds, right? And the way the body shape uh, differs between these different groups is related to the method of flight and the way they get their food, and therefore the, the diet too. They all eat vertebrates again, but look at the way they get the food. If we take a look at the Budio, it tends to be a broad-winged, big, broad tail. So that Budio in the upper left is a rough-legged hawk. Then you go around to the right, there's an accipiter. Notice it has a long tail, this Cooper's hawk, and a little shorter, stubbier wings. Falcon has the pointiest wings. That's a prairie falcon and a medium, long tail. So these differences in body shape have a lot to do with the way they get their food. A budio eats primarily mammal prey, okay? And the strike and kill method differs between a budio and the other two. Budios approach their prey slowly with their feet going perhaps 15 miles an hour when they hit the prey. And this is, uh, has been determined through high-speed cinematography, okay? If the prey is oriented crosswise, both feet might be used. If the prey is running lengthwise away from the hawk, a single foot can be used. Accipiters, on the other hand, the ones with a longer tail and the narrower or shorter, stubbier wings, approach their prey at about 40 miles an hour. And at the very last minute, swing their feet forward, adding another 20 miles an hour just before the strike when the wings are breaking. So notice that goshawk hitting the pigeon there in the bottom right at about 60 miles an hour. So they'll take bird prey primarily, usually from the ground or from a tree. Okay, it's very different than the mammal prey that the Budio is getting. Then the third group, the falcons, these tend to take bird prey primarily, and they're taking prey right out of the sky, birds that are flying. Falcons can fly in excess of 100 miles an hour and short duration glancing blow is delivered to the prey in the air. They may turn to restrike the critter or grasp it in the air and go onto the ground to feed on it. Okay, here's the last example of how differences in bird shape are associated with the way they capture their prey. This is a more subtle example from flycatchers. It shows the same principle. So now we're dealing with a bunch of species in one family flycatchers, right? They all just jump out from branches and grab bugs, right? Well, there's differences in the shapes of these flycatchers. They go from, if you look at the morphology axis, the x-axis, they go from larger birds on the left side with a large aspect ratio, okay, so they have longer pointier wings, to smaller birds with lower aspect ratio, a little stubbier wings, okay? And the little ones with the stubbier wings also have long rictal bristles, little mustache like, like bristles. And the behavior then, corresponding behavior differs. They go from uh, increased pursuing as you get out toward the smaller birds, decreased hawking, whereas the bigger birds spend most of their time hawking. That is, they sit on a branch, fly out, grab something, and go back to the branch again. They don't chase the insect item down, whereas the little ones tend to chase the insects down. So what's amazing is the morphology, differences in morphology, subtle differences explain differences in behavior. So why we see so many species probably has a lot to do with the way they're getting the diet item, not diet per se. That's the lesson here. So to wrap up, it's not diet per se, that's related to the variety we see. Things like foot position and toe structure are related to things like the depth of the feeding zone, how and where birds get their food. 
you can see leg and toe structure clearly related to where these birds feed as well as what they feed on. So diet, it's in there. Yeah, diet's in there. But my point is that the way they're getting a particular kind of food item is, is also very important. Some birds have tools and shapes that allow them to exploit flish, uh, fish near water surface. Others have tools to dive to various depths. Loons can go 90 feet. Old squaw uh, duck 200 feet. Penguins can go over 1,000 feet to get basically the same kind of food. Even subtle differences in toe structure and claw length are related, related to the way different species move to get basically the same kind of food. Here, insects. And even these little things running around on the ground. They differ in that they, whether they run fast, they have slow walks, or whether they hop. All these things are related. These differences are related to the way they get food and they result in different food types 